host of Comedy Central's The Daily Show, Jon Stewart, is spilling the beans about the rancorous relationship between he and his former employer, Apple, to none other than Federal Trade Commission Chair Lena Khan. Now, Khan has aggressively gone after big tech, saying they've become too powerful. Khan and Stewart hit on topics ranging from AI, antitrust laws, and even that Apple forbade him from interviewing her for his Apple Plus show that was terminated after two years. Let's take a look. I wanted to have you on a podcast, and Apple asked us not to do it, to have you. They, they literally said, please don't talk to her, having nothing to do with what you do for a living. I think they just... <laughs> I didn't think they cared for you, is what happened. <laughs> now, as head of the agency, Khan made it clear that she was going to go after those big tech companies for antitrust behavior, a point Stewart did not shy away from. They wouldn't let us do even that dumb thing we just did in the first act on AI. Like, what is that sensitivity? Why are they so afraid to even have these conversations out in the public sphere? I think it just shows one of the dangers of what happens when you concentrate so much power and so much decision making in a small number of companies. Now, Stewart says he was fired because he wanted to cover AI in China, a country that Apple operates in. Apple is entangled in a lawsuit from the Justice Department for anti-competitive behavior with regard to the App Store, the Apple Watch, and messaging. Joining us now to discuss is Research Director at the American Economic Liberties Project, Matt Stoller. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Hey, thanks for having me. So what did you make of this exchange, Don Stewart going after his former bosses at Apple on all of these subjects? Is this surprising at all? It's not surprising. It, it's clumsy, but it speaks to the, um, the reason that the Department of Justice has sued Apple over uh, unfair um, and coercive monopolization practices. Essentially, Apple is has an enormous market power and uses that market power in a whole host of ways, some elements of which include raising prices on smartphones, um, uh, interchange fees for transactions when you use your smartphone to buy things, um, an app store, 30% app store tax on app developers, but also that Apple is doing things like trying to shape speech in America. And this is a really good example. They do it uh, on, on their Apple TV, Apple TV Plus, and their podcasting systems. They shape speech aggressively. They also do it through their other channels in ways that are more subtle. So this is a really nice example of Apple's authoritarian behavior, which really comes back to their market power. Yeah, it's one thing to be talking about some of these kind of anti-competitive moves, you know, are they going to make me a phone that has compatible chargers and all of those kinds of things. I don't mean to dismiss right. that, but this does seem to be another kind of realm of interference that I don't know that is widely associated with a company like Apple that has such sort of a progressive, good liberal branding. You seem to be alluding to the idea that this isn't the only instance that you're aware of where they have used their status as a sort of um, a platform or a publisher of media content to suppress speech, to suppress content that is uh, antithetical to its kind of uh, corporate interests? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's two places to think about it. The first is their media business, which is competitive. You know, Apple TV is not the only streamer out there. But it's very clear that they don't allow conversations about China, right? On a very basic level. Um, you want to do a show, you can't touch China. Uh, and you can't touch questions of political economy, as we're seeing. Don't talk to, to Lena Khan. Don't talk about AI. So they're trying to control speech in areas where they, they don't necessarily have market power, but where they have, um, where they have some leverage. Uh, but the other aspect of it is where they do have market power. And this is where you would see, you know, the, the ecosystem around the smartphone. And that's the basis of the DOJ's case. So app stores, um, uh, the transactions where you, um, when you buy things through your phone, cloud gaming. On the other side, they have enormous, they're the biggest semiconductor buyer in the world. So they have enormous power over the supply chain. Um, it's really interesting with Apple. They have an amazing brand that they've spent billions of dollars investing in. But they are also, if you talk to a lot of people in business, they're probably the scariest corporation out there. Like there is so much fear around Apple because Apple 
will just kill your business. They will just kill your ability to get on the app store. And getting on the app store is often a life or death question for a lot of businesses. Or they will kill your ability to use to use, to have CarPlay on your car, right? And that, if you're a car manufacturer, you need CarPlay. Otherwise, a substantial number of people will not buy your car because they want to connect their iPhone to their car. That's a must-have now. And one of the things in the in the DOJ's complaint, interestingly enough, was saying Apple is now giving orders to auto manufacturers and saying the entire user experience in the automobile, including the fuel gauges and everything else, Apple is demanding the ability to organize all of that or else they're not going to sell you CarPlay. And the car companies are afraid to talk about it. So you have authoritarian behavior that's happening across the economy wherever Apple can touch things and smartphones touch things increasingly in lots of different areas. But you saw this really good illustration of it where they actually censored their own regulator on TV. So this is a really serious problem. And I think you're right to point out that it's not just about charging a little bit more here or there. It's about giving really serious orders about how we experience the world and what we can even talk about. Here's my issue with the China part of this, because obviously I agree that not um, not criticizing China or allowing criticism of China in, in what in, in increasingly a lot of um, creative uh, ways on like TV shows that are being made on these streaming services, right? They want to shy away from having anything to do with China because that offends the Chinese government. I think that's absolutely bad. At the same time, it's not really, I mean, it's it's the, the aggressor, right, is, is the Chinese government for having that policy of retaliating in such a way. Whereas I, I don't really know what the solution is. Like, you know, Google only being allowed, for instance, in China if it censors certain search results. Obviously, that's bad, and we don't want Google to do that. And Google, frankly, I don't think doesn't want to do that. But in order to operate in China at all, it has to. Is that really a, I mean, the, the, the fault there is the Chinese government. Now, I don't know what to do about that. But it seems to me not ex not it. It seems to me like it's uh, frankly a hard call for what a company or a creator of content should do in the situation where they're going to be shut out of this market. They're not going to be able to produce speech at all unless they comply with some level of restriction being imposed on them. Yeah. So it's interesting. China, Google, and um, and Facebook actually don't operate in China. And um, so they they have, don't have that problem, or at least they don't have as much of that problem. There are they have, do have some links to China, but Apple has, um, you know, they have their a lot of their supply chain there. They can't operate without China, and they also are a big, you know, China is one of their biggest markets. And I think you're right to point out that it's a hard it's where you where you draw lines is really difficult when you have a, you know, you have such an enmeshed industrial supply chains between America and China, and then Chinese government engages in certain coercive actions, what do US companies do about that? I think that's a difficult question. But where I think it's an easy question is with a company like Apple, where are they doing things to reduce their dependence on China or not? And um, uh, if they're if they're trying to double down on their dependence on China, then I think you can blame them for that because they're trying to make the problem worse. And I think what you've seen, you know, the day that um, the DOJ filed this case and, uh, and Apple knew the case was coming, the CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, was not at headquarters trying to figure out what to do about it, talk to customers, talk to lawyers, whatever. He was in Shanghai. He was visiting with the uh, with the with the Chinese um, government officials, he was trying to shore up Apple's business in China, and he was talking about how important China was as a partner to Apple. They lobby against bills like the you know bills that prohibit um, Uyghur forced labor produced products from coming into the U.S. They lobby for um, to make sure that they can still produce or buy semiconductors produced in China. They lobby aggressively to continue this entanglement that I think is bad for both countries. So that's kind of where I would blame Apple. Um, they've made the problem worse. Uh, they've, they've made a strategic choice and they keep doubling down on it. Matt, so much of the anti-establishment um, narrative that I think is, not narrative, that sounds dismissive, but arguments that are being made, I think, more from the right than the left right now in terms of mainstream 
politics are about are, are very critical of the perceived relationship between kind of big tech and companies like Apple and the Democratic Party. We see this in the um, reporting on the Twitter files, which demonstrates real evidence of a kind of an overlap there. But what you seem to be describing here is that uh, for whatever reason, Joe Biden has picked um, this uh, and Lita Khan, someone who is genuinely uh, enforcing rules that I think are beneficial to the consumer, but negative for a company like Apple. And you're seeing, uh, you've described what seems to be a desire for, for closeness between Tim Cook and its business interests in China. So I wonder how you're seeing this and in the political context, the choice between a, a Donald Trump and a Joe Biden. Is Donald Trump or a Republican candidate in this instance the one who is more likely to basically be more aligned with the business interests of a company like Apple? So it's it's hard to know, but I think, and it's a great question. And what I would say is that the, you know, every administration is a set, uh, it's a coalition and they're not always coherent. So you have certain elements of the Biden administration, Lena Khan at the FTC, Jonathan Cantor at the antitrust division, who are very aggressive about taking on unfair coercive practices from big tech. So the Biden administration has brought four cases, uh, antitrust cases against trillion dollar plus big tech firms, actually five, but um, forget about the Microsoft Activision merger. They've been very aggressive about taking on big tech. At the same time, I think you would look at the national security apparatus a Jake Sullivan or at the DOJ, you'd see like a Lisa Monaco, they are highly deferential to big tech. And so you have kind of conflict within the administration. But in general, it's really, I mean, the, the Democratic Party on policy terms, maybe not political terms, but on policy terms, has been really pretty aggressive in addressing the problem of big tech monopoly power. Yeah. Trump uh, brought a case against Google and a case against Facebook. So it's not that you know Trump is in the pocket of big tech. He did that, but he also did a number of things that were really problematic. He put very big, strong pro-big tech stuff in the rewrite of NAFTA. Um, and I think there are really open questions about how aggressive the Trump administration might be to address big tech. Um, but you know, there, there's, there's, a, it's not like a slam dunk case that Trump would be in the pocket of big tech. But I think we do know that the Biden administration is very assertive against big tech, uh, at least on the antitrust and competition policy front. Matt Stoller, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.